Um, so welcome everybody to the online launch of Reconnection, Meeting the Climate Crisis Inside Out. I am neither Jamie Bristow nor Katie White, um, so I'm stepping in at the last minute for Katie, who unfortunately cannot be here because of work commitments, um, but is um, gutted to be missing it and has, has been very involved in the report itself. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined here today by an amazing panel um, who you can probably see on screen right now. So two of the report's authors, Jamie Bristow and Professor Christine Wamsler. We also have MP Caroline Lucas, Yoko Alenda and Tom rivet Karnak. And I'll give them all a proper introduction when we come to hear from them all later. Um, just a couple of housekeeping points. We have Pilar here, who is excellently going to help us with the technical side of running this webinar and hopefully won't leave it like I just did. Um, Pilar will be running the Q&As. So if you do have questions for our panelists, please drop them into the Q&A function on the webinar itself um, and we'll come to those at the end of the session. You'll all be muted and we've also disabled the chat just so that it's not distracting for the panelists. So please do use that Q&A function um, as much as you can. Um, we're also going to be recording this webinar for anybody who wants to rewatch it or who wasn't able to make it. And um, so that's just something to bear in mind. I think that's all the housekeeping. So now turning to the fabulous report itself, um, having been sort of uh, involved to some extent and watching Jamie, Christine and Rosie work their magic on this report, um, it's been amazing seeing it really turn into a tour de force and actually put into words. Um, the importance of our inner capacities and our inner development and how they may impact um, how we respond to the climate crisis, but also the root causes of that crisis. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Christine Wamsler, who is from Lund University Centre for Sustainable Studies. They've worked with us in collaborating the report, and we've also had very generous support from the Emergence Foundation. So Christine is a renowned expert in her field. It was a complete honor for us to work on this with her. She's worked in this area for over 25 years, both in theory and practice, and has written over, I think, 200 papers on the topic. So it's pretty expert. Um, so Christine is gonna talk through the background to the research, and then we're gonna hear from Jamie with more of an introduction to the report itself before we go to our panelists. So over to you, Christine. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, let's see if I managed to share my screen first. Okay. So yes, um, Jane and Ruth asked me to kick off with a few words about the background and context of our con reconnection report from a research perspective. I'd like to begin by highlighting that our report builds on pioneering research, which demonstrates that climate change is not an external technological crisis, but a relationship crisis, or in other words, the result of an inner human crisis of disconnection. Examples of such research are empirical studies from the past international climate conferences, and systematic academic reviews of current knowledge. These studies have resulted in increasing calls for more integrative policy approaches, which link inner and outer dimensions of climate change and nourish human inner capacities that can help us reconnect. As an outcome of this research, the need for such integrative approaches has also been highlighted in this year's IPCC assessment reports in both the report on climate change adaptation and the one on mitigation. And this is a real milestone and we hope that our policy report can leverage related work. Another breakthrough is the fact that both research and the IPCC reports make reference to the potential role of mindfulness or meditation more broadly to support more integrative um, climate policy and action, so long as it's not applied in an instrumentalized way and becomes devoid of its ecological and social awareness. It is thus crucial to explore if and how related approaches can best be oriented towards sustainability and mainstreamed into current institutional and policy structures. Um, and our report is an important step in this direction. 
Turning to our reconnection report, it's important to underline that its elaboration has in itself involved extensive research. Over a period of around 18 months, we conducted 25 in-depth interviews with politicians and policymakers around the world. We reviewed many, many research studies and held extensive consultations with leading experts working on the intersection between the inner and outer transformation that we need for sustainability. Um, then we put together the findings from the interviews and the wider consultation to get an understanding of how politicians and policymakers perceive the intersection of mind and climate change, how it's currently considered in policymaking, and how it could be further considered in policymaking, policymaking to bring about the change that we seek. The first outcome of this work was the preparation of an academic article, which in turn provided a strong foundation for our policy report. A key finding of our article was that we can divide the ways in which policymakers and politicians um, perceive the intersection of mind and climate change into four categories. Firstly, our minds are clearly a victim of increasing climate impacts, leading to a vast increase in climate anxiety across society. So one of the first things you generally hear politicians talk about is the number of young people who are feeling grief, anxiety, overwhelm or fear as a result of the ecological collapse and the kind of projections that we are currently looking at. Secondly, a less common but increasingly prominent perspective is that the mind is described as being a key driver or root cause of the climate crisis. So we tend to think um, of climate change as a technical problem and most sustainability policy adopts that approach. However, we are increasingly starting to understand that actually there are certain human tendencies and mechanisms of mind and our mindset that drive, for instance, consumerism, patterns of production and consumption. They ultimately relate to our disconnection to ourselves, others and nature and underlie the climate crisis. Thirdly, we found that the mind is identified as a barrier to climate action. So not only is it seen as a driver and a victim, um, but we can also see certain biases or even denial. There are a myriad of ways in which we are our own worst enemy when it comes to actually making change happen. I expect that you're probably very familiar with this. Um, and finally, there are some policymakers who have a good understanding of the three first categories. And these people clearly see the vicious cycle that is created between the mind and climate change. For instance, as much as mind is driving climate change, Climate change is driving negative mental health, well-being, fear, etc., which in turn exacerbate certain unsustainable response mechanisms at individual and collective levels. So ultimately, this vicious cycle drives the deterioration of personal and planetary well-being. At the same time, Jamie and I show in our research article that this vicious cycle of mind and climate change is unfortunately not addressed in mainstream climate policy and policy making approaches, which consequently fail to adequately address climate change. We also found that climate policy tends to adopt the same frame of reference or language, or in, in other words, it operates within the same collective mindset that created the climate crisis in the first place, and so it fuels the identified vicious cycle. Although we can see that some people have been trying to change or challenge that mindset from without, we very rarely find that our assumptions are challenged from within mainstream climate policy institutions. Moreover, the exceptions, the, the individual pioneers who engage in challenging current approaches from within tend to be marginalized. Finally, our article identifies some important lessons from efforts to integrate mindfulness and well-being in policy fields such as education, health and workplace, 
that provided insights into how to better integrate aspects of mind into climate policies. We have considered the findings from our research in our policy report, and we hope that it will contribute to a much needed overdue change in current, and pro current approaches to climate change and sustainability. Um, and this is crucial because we urgently need new integrative approaches and such approaches require an explicit consideration of our minds and inner capacities, the inner dimension of climate change, which is ultimately not an individual issue, but a manifestation of collective experiences and processes. There's one important aspect that I would like to highlight in this context as it frequently comes up, the urgency of the situation. My personal take on this is that there are many apparent paradoxes when dealing with climate change as they are when engaging with contemplative practices. And one of them is the fact that slowing down in the sense of becoming still and finding the stillness and awareness inside might mean moving forward faster in the end. Change can in fact be quick if we start addressing and linking systems change, behavioral change, cultural, cultural change, and at the same time, the underlying inner dimension of, of climate change. Our report promotes such integrative approaches and the knowledge and recommendations that we present here have clear implications for public policy and policy making, such as how the issue of climate change is portrayed and communicated, the goals that are pursued, the measures that, we, that are promoted, how they are implemented and the performance targets that are applied. So to conclude, I'm grateful and happy to see so many of you here today. And I hope you will join us in pushing forward the development of more integrative policy approaches and measures for sustainability. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Jamie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us. This report represents um, over two years of work in collaborative research and writing. But in some ways, for me, it's more like 12 years. It's the outcome of everything I've been trying to do since my own realization, back when I was working in a climate change campaign, that mindfulness is a missing piece in responding to the climate crisis. Over much of that time, I've been working with many different colleagues trying to articulate that, that neglected inner dimension of the outer change the world needs. It's been a real meeting of minds and a privilege to collaborate with Christine, who's been working towards the same goal from the other side, from the perspective of sustainability sciences. And we're publishing at a time when the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has begun referencing for the first time the role of inner transition towards sustainability in their reporting. Before I go into that, I must also mention here our talented co-author, Rosie Bell, who has been a valued uh, thinking partner as well as our chief wordsmith and thank Ben O'Brien for his wonderful illustrations. Thanks also to the many contributors and critical friends who have offered insights and really helped us to improve our thinking in recent months. We're standing on the shoulders of this, of this amazing network of thinkers and practitioners who are so generous and collaborative in just the way that we really need to be in order to do anything meaningful about the climate crisis. So I'll do my best in a very limited time to outline, outline the report. The thinking here echoes increasingly across the, across the sustainability field as we try to figure out what it is about our current technical and policy solutions that just aren't getting anywhere fast enough when it comes to climate change. The answer um, that more and more of us are coming to is that while we concentrate on external solutions to physical problems, we're completely ignoring where the climate crisis actually comes from, from inside us, from the human heart and mind and our culture. And when you look at it from this side, it's possible to see that climate change originates in a, in, in a human crisis of relationship. It's happening because of the many aspects of our inner lives that are now fractured and disconnected. And the same disconnection is getting in the way of implementing the solutions we need. We are completely inter interdependent with this living world. We can't harm it without harming ourselves. 
And as we're now finding out everything we do is consequential at a global scale, we are connected. But the way we are inside, the way we see the world, and the choices that govern our behavior are informed by a sense of separateness, by this deeply conditioned cultural worldview that tells us that we're independent. On this view, the world isn't part of us, it's a resource to be exploited. And this disconnection influences the structures and technology we build as a society and is reflected back to us by those things, making our inner lives even more fragmented, keeping us disconnected from ourselves, from each other, and from the natural world and what we're doing it and what we're doing to it. So what we and many others are advocating in this context is re reconnection throughout all these broken relationships. If we're going to want and co-create and negotiate and implement all the climate solutions we so urgently need, then it begins with reconnection and the development of the human skills and capacities that facilitate that connection from within. Humans actually possess capacities for deep connection with ourselves, with others, and with nature. It's just that these faculties are deprioritized and underdeveloped in the way that we currently live our lives. These innate connective faculties include mindfulness and compassion, and the practices that develop mindfulness and compassion are the principal focus of this report. At this moment, I must say, in fact, that there are many, many more practices, particularly in, in, in indigenous and wisdom traditions that enact and embody this conscious connection. And they're absent from this work only because it follows an evidence base informed by a particular set of Western scientific values. But, you're like, but as you're likely to find, um, sorry, <clears throat> but you're likely to find as this field progresses that they are equally central to the kind of inner work that is needed. But yes, uh, here is our report. Um, and we specifically make the case for evidence-based mindfulness and compassion training as enablers of the conscious connection that's fundamental to human functioning at all times, and particularly vital when it comes to different aspects of the climate crisis. We take a number of these human factors to, uh, or needs and link them with theory and evidence that recommend mindfulness and compassion training as effective interventions in supporting this inner dimension of sustainability. So, uh, Starting off in chapter one, um, we attend to what we call the fundamentals of connection. We divide these faculties into aspects of mind, body, and heart. But as is clearly a running theme, nothing about them is truly separate, apart from the way that we tend to think about them. So running through them linearly, you know, even though they are themselves deeply non-linear, we have, first of all, the mind. So in, in the domain of mind, we examine the faculties of attention, receptivity, and perspective taking. The foundations of our perceptual connection to the world. We discussed the ways that innate biases and susceptibility to distraction can disrupt this connection and how the digital economy amplifies these tendencies, leaving us disconnected from reality at a time of crisis. Here we examine mindfulness training as an emancipating choice that empowers us to put our attention where we want it to cultivate qualities like allowing care and curiosity that keeps us open to new information and understand our circumstances more fully from different perspectives. Turning next to the body, we argue that a culture that devalues the body is reflected in disconnection from the living world and ultimately in unsustainable behaviors. We know also the tendency to disregard what our, body, what our bodies have to tell us drastically limiting our understanding as we tackle urgent challenges. We present evidence about the ways mindfulness training can help us to reconnect to bodily intelligence. We discuss also the body's tendency to close down through maladaptive threat responses and trauma, driving social fragmentation that increases unsustainable behavior and limits climate response. Here, mindfulness and compassion can help us regulate triggers and overcome social barriers allowing us to collect collectively to face uh, our shared challenges. In the domain of heart, we, uh, we explore the human feelings and qualities that have evolved to help us connect with each other. Like, bodily, like body sensation, these emotions are often dismissed as somehow soft or less important in our rationalist culture. But we're learning now that it's humanity's capacity for bonding and collaboration has been our greatest, greatest advantage as we evolved. 
and our capacities for compassion, empathy and emotional intelligence are active, empowering and fundamental to our welfare individually and collectively. We also need to cultivate and amplify them if we're going to connect emotionally with the impact of our cultures and lifestyles on the environment, which is a vital missing piece in climate action. And here compassion practice and mindfulness are two pathways to reactivating what we might call the heart connection. So having established these three fundamentals of connection that underpin human welfare at all times, we turn to some specific ways in which mindful and compassionate reconnection matter in the context of climate action. First of all, we ask uh, what it takes to stay with the trouble of the crisis, to engage with the painful reality of climate change when we might feel the urge to shut down and avoid that discomfort. Here, compassion and mindfulness practice are both profoundly valuable in helping us to turn towards difficult experiences and process their emotional impact. Furthermore, because mindfulness supports us to investigate how distress, distress actually works, it can help us to locate the source of that distress both inside and outside of ourselves, empowering us to actually do something about it. Here, new social mindfulness intervention, interventions are vitally important in plugging that inner inquiry into the wider world and helping us to create change. We also look at the way that mental health impacts of the climate crisis are driving unsustainable behavior in a vicious cycle and also forming barriers to action we need to take. We show how mindfulness and compassion can help us to cultivate resilience and positive emotion, turning the vicious cycle into a positive spiral of individual and planetary well-being. Having considered what it takes to stay engaged in the crisis, uh, we then ask how we might begin to see it differently, to unpick some of the thinking that produces and drives the problem we're facing. We trace the roots of the climate crisis back to this worldview of separateness, because these shared stories about what it means to be human shape culture and mass behavior at such a deep level. They also represent a really deep leverage point for the change in the, con for change in the context of sustainability. Here we discuss ways in which mindfulness in particular can help us to really examine our belief systems and nurture a way of looking at the world so that we see it as interconnected or intraconnected that sees the self, the person, as an intrinsic part of a bigger whole. In this context, we discuss the effect of mindfulness and compassion on reducing polarization and really importantly, on increasing the sense of nature connection, of identification with nature that we need to really transform behavior towards sustainability. Finally, we turn our attention downstream to the possibility of taking appropriate action on climate, because it's possible to see that even if we're really engaged, even if we come to see our profound connectedness with each other and with the world, that this doesn't directly lead to the action we need. It's crucial for any change initiative to understand that there are innate disruptions in the human circuitry of intentional action. There are always gaps between what we know, what we want, and what, <clears throat> and what <laughs> between what we know and what we want, what we want and what we do. These have to do with our evolution. For example, we're programmed to want what feels and tastes good in the short term over more ab abstract goals like well-being in the long term. But they're also baked into the systems we've created together as a result. For example, the powerful consumer culture that amplifies these outdated desires disconnecting us at all levels of society and governance from a realistic sense of what we need, what others need, and what the world needs. Sustainability scientists now talk about a values action gap, and it's a huge problem in the context of climate change. So here we argue that mindfulness and compassion training help us to reattune our focus towards qualities like appreciation and care, reducing the goal-driven tendency to reach for more and more. They help us to reconnect with deeper values in the context of a culture that pulls us towards unsustainable habits. And mindfulness in particular supports us to learn about and to overcome deep running automatic behaviors and impulses. Vitally, in the current social media age, helping us to escape from patterns of digit digitally manipulated unsustainable behavior and reconnect our actions with our e um, ethical intentions. We conclude by urging policymakers to see ways in which all these faculties of connection, all these pieces of evidence for mindfulness and compassion 
combine to form, um, to form a vital integrated approach to the inner dimension of sustainability. It's not the whole picture, but it's a big piece that we need um, that, that's been missing. Climate change is a physical reality. And it demands urgent political and practical solutions. But to want and co-create and implement those solutions calls upon those inner capacities, calls upon trainable inner capacities that include mindfulness and compassion. And for that reason, we make specific policy recommendations and urge decision makers to invest now in the inner capacities that have been ignored for so long in, in addressing the climate crisis. So with that, I will hand back over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much, everybody, for, um, for your attention. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Christine, for giving us such a wonderful overview there of the report. And for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet or look at it, um, Pilar has put a link in the chat, so please do look at it after the, after the webinar if we've piqued your interest. But now we're going to turn to our absolutely wonderful panel, who are going to share some reflections on the report itself and also on the wider issues of inner capacities and the climate crisis. So firstly, I'm going to turn to Caroline Lucas. Caroline has been an MP in the UK Parliament since 2010. She's been a leader of the Green Party twice and is extremely well known as a political activist when it comes to issues of climate and sustainability. So we're honoured to have her here today. And over to you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. And thank you so much to Jamie and Christine. I'm really honoured to uh, join you here this afternoon. Um, very happy to um, just say a few things about what I think is an incredibly important report. And the bit that I really wanted to pick up on to start with really is the emphasis in the report on how mindfulness helps to develop the art of paying attention in the here and now. And that sounds very straightforward, but actually as we all know, it, it, it isn't really. So paying attention is that sense of being utterly present in the moment at one with nature around us. And I think that that experience enhances the sense of being in nature and is potentially transformative. Because I'd like to make the case really that a deep appreciation of the natural world, a love for it, is a precondition for its protection. And not only does a mindful connection with nature have the potential to inspire us to work harder to protect it, but I think also it equips us crucially with the strength we need to confront the true scale of the environmental crisis that we face. I'm always struck by the powerful words by the US author Richard Louvre. He wrote a wonderful book called Last Child in the Woods, and it's basically about saving our children from what he calls nature deficit disorder. And he puts it so well when he says, we won't protect what we don't love, we won't love what we don't know, and we can't know what we don't see or touch or hear. And I guess I would add on to the end of that and mindfully experience. And of course, the stakes could hardly be higher. Over the 20 years since David Attenborough first sounded the alarm, we have destroyed even more of the natural world. The UK, for example, is one of the most nature depleted countries on the earth. We now live in an impoverished land where, where hedgehogs and butterflies and bees and farmland birds and wildflowers are rarities, not common fellow travelers. In my lifetime alone, the world has lost, or I should say destroyed 60% of its populations of mammals and birds and fishes and reptiles in just the briefest blink of an evolutionary eye, we are systematically destroying the life that lives alongside us on this astonishing planet. And I suppose unless we know and love what's at threat, then I fear we'll be less equipped to fight to protect it. And the answer to that isn't just a greater exposure to and understanding of nature, although that's something I'm campaign campaigning for in Parliament, through the introduction of a new GCSE in natural history. And I'm delighted that just last week, the government has agreed to introduce that. But it's about a mindful awareness of nature. It's an immersion in it, a feeling for it, a sense that we're not separate from it, that what we do to the world around us, we quite literally do ultimately to ourselves. 
So that's the first point about that intimate connection with nature that gives us the, the motivation, if you like, and, and the mobilization to, to act in its defense. But there's a second related, but maybe even more important reason that for me, mindfulness is vital from the perspective of climate and nature. And that's because when we're confronted with the scale of the loss that we face, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, I think that we need help, or at least I should speak for myself, I need help in dealing with the fear and grief that goes along with that, as well as support in finding the inner strength necessary to take the action to address it. And I'm particularly worried about our young people because I think our young people need that so much too. You know, the youth climate strikes, I think are one of the most inspiring and hopeful things that have happened in years. But if you look at some of their brightly painted handmade posters, you'll see the most traumatic, if you like, um, expressions of what they're going through. Save our future, say those, those posters. Why aren't you panicking, they say. Your apathy about my future scares me, they say. We are killing our world. And they are absolutely right and they seem more prepared to confront the truth actually than many adults and certainly than most politicians. The story of the industrial world's destruction of the planet is the story of a single lifetime. The planet brought from seeming stability to the brink of catastrophe in just say my lifetime alone. And we've got the evidence all around us, the studies that show us that we've got the hottest year, year on year, or that there are more heat waves or wildfires in all parts of the world. We don't lack evidence when it comes to why we don't act. And that question about why don't we act given what we know is one that has haunted me for a long time. There's a wonderful film called The Age of Stupid. It was made about 10 years ago. And its premise was that after some kind of climate catastrophe in around 2050, there is one sole survivor played by the wonderful actor, Pete Pothelswaite. In that film, he looks back at reels of television footage, real footage from weather events over the past few years. And he says in words that still make the hairs go up on the back of my neck, why is it, knowing what we knew then, we didn't act when there was still time? And that seems to me to be the most important question of our time. It does quite literally haunt me. Why is it that we seem to be content to go down in history as the species that spent all its time monitoring its own extinction rather than taking active steps to avoid it. We can put forward a whole set of reasons, the power and vested interests of the fossil fuel companies, for example, who are increasingly not simply lobbying government, but being given senior roles within it. Or there's the fact that people are just too busy trying to get by, trying to keep a roof over their heads, trying to put food on the table, or that we're being bombarded by hundreds of advertisements each day, all of them persuading us to go out and do some more consuming. In the wonderful words of Professor Tim Jackson, to spend money we don't have on things we don't need, to make impressions that don't last on people we don't even care very much about. So the lack of progress on tackling the climate crisis is undoubtedly caused by this mixture of vested interests, of political paralysis, of civic ambiguity, that is true. But I believe that another part of the reason is that we don't dare feel what climate change is truly about. Academically, theoretically, we know about the dangers of exceeding 1.5 degrees heating, but rarely do we risk emotionally connecting with that reality. And perhaps one of the reasons we don't is that we fear the darkness that might engulf us if we do. How do we cope with the thought that humanity may not wake up in time, that climate change might become irreversible, that societies might no longer have the ability to respond or cope. And it's in trying to answer those questions that personally I've turned to mindfulness. Because if one of the main reasons for practicing mindfulness is to achieve a deeper well-being for ourselves and others, then that surely has to encompass the larger world around us on which our well-being depends. The state of the world in terms of the accelerating climate and environmental crisis might well be something that it's tempting to turn away from as being too overwhelming, too scary to really look at. But what is mindfulness if not turning towards the places that scare us? You know, we do this internally in our practice whenever something comes up that's uncomfortable. And we can do the same with what is deeply uncomfortable and scary out there in the world, whether that's the accelerating climate crisis or the rate with which species are becoming extinct 
and ecosystems are being lost. And from a place of interconnectedness and care, it seems that we might have the best chance of engaging in mindful and compassionate action and encouraging and supporting others to do the same. So clearly mindfulness is not a silver bullet, but I believe it offers us some vital tools. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote about how, and I quote, the most precious gift we can offer others is our presence. When our mindfulness embraces those we love, they will bloom like flowers. And similarly, perhaps only by being fully present in and with the natural world, can we begin to know and love and truly care for it. And if mindfulness can help us regain that intimacy, then we can begin to know and understand the reality of what it is to face losing so many of the earth species and the biosphere, and hopefully at the same time, develop the resilience and the courage and the practical tools to prevent it. And I very much welcome this report as a vital step in that process. Thank you, Caroline. So many reflections there and so much passion in what you've been saying. Um, I have so many questions that I want to ask you. <laughs> I am also conscious of time. I'm gonna ask you one though, which is around the nature connection that, that you've talked about. Um, and I guess that is, Obviously, for us to be able to practice mindfulness in nature, we need access to nature. And so whether or not you had any reflections um, around how we increase the connections to nature and how we encourage people to get out there and to, to give the time to it, because like you said, there are so many demands on our time and our attention. How do we put nature at the forefront of all of this? Well, you couldn't have asked me a nicer question if I'd uh, if I'd asked you to, because um, <laughs> that speaks to a campaign that I that I am really um, working on now in Parliament, which is about increasing our legal access to green space around us. And I'm speaking now, I, I admit, from a purely England perspective. So with many apologies from many of the people that are on this call who are not based in England. But here in England, we only have a legal access to 8% of, of the land of this country. It's very different in Scotland, it's very different in the Nordic countries. And um, what I want to do is to uh, get a change to a particular act, the Countryside and Rights of Way Act, which would uh, increase that access so that we would have a far greater access to Rome. Because it feels to me that although there are plenty of footpaths in this country and they are very important to have, that sense of getting lost in nature, that sense of, of really being intimate with nature often happens when you get off the footpath and you go into some of the wilder areas. So I think part of it is about having greater green space that we have a legal right to. And as I say, that's part of this campaign that I'm working on right now. But it's also just about when there are new housing developments built, making sure that green space is built into the original planning decisions that go into those developments. So every new housing estate should have green space and hopefully that's people's gardens but if it isn't then at the very least it is having access to um, a, a meaningful piece of, of, of green space and parkland within within a five or ten minute maximum walk from where people live it is about designing that in to our planning process right from the very start because i think unless we make it easy for people to do this stuff then it won't happen i think the pandemic showed us and reminded us just how important green space is for our physical and our mental health. And I think people recognize that in a way that perhaps we'd taken for granted until then. Um, but we need to learn from that now. We need to not just go back to so-called normal because normal wasn't great for an awful lot of people and actually make sure that we do do things better going forward. Great, thank you so much, Caroline. Um, so important. And just to remind everybody that we do have the question and answers function. And um, so please, in particular, kind of make use of the fact that we have such an amazing panel and direct some questions to them. Um, and you can also upvote on the questions and answers. So if you see a question that you particularly like and you think, yes, I would like to hear the answer to that, I think you can vote for it in a, a snazzy Zoom technology way. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Yoko Alenda, who we are very pleased to be joined by. Um, Yoko is a member of the Estonian Parliament and Chair of the Environment Committee, and she also leads the Mindfulness Group within that Parliament. So we'll have a lot to say on this, I'm sure. So over to you, Yoko. Yes, <clears throat> hello. Of course, very uh, honoured to be here and uh, a long-time follower of the Mindfulness Initiative and uh, Jamie 
who is uh, one of the authors behind this uh, great report. Uh, so yes, uh, I am from this small country which mainly consists of nature, actually, Estonia here uh, on, the, on the northern uh, side. And a few remarks. Uh, so I have had the uh, honor of being in the parliament for, for two periods and in this uh, second term now since last year's February, uh, working as a chair of the environmental committee. And uh, I have had a quite, uh, quite a lot of, um, I would say, experiences uh, in uh, how these uh, clashes uh, happen daily, basically. Uh, but uh, so, so I have uh, had a chance to also um, um, be, I think, one of the people who have been um, talked to when this report was uh, was done, and uh, and I've thought about it ever since. It's uh, it seems to me uh, more and more uh, important, actually. So I think I think it is highly timely, and of course, much bigger than than any of us realizes. I think we will be living in an existential crisis. Uh, I don't know for how, how much longer, but at least for as long as all of us who are present here will be here, I think. Uh, I think uh, we are running out of resources and that is, uh, or we are not running out of resources. We have uh, used up most of the resources. And maybe, um, of course, I cannot uh, get away from also sharing the experience of Estonia, who being um, um, uh, one of the countries which is also receiving a lot of the refugees from uh, Ukraine, uh, which is at war. Uh, during the last, uh, we have never really had much migration, immigration. And now, during the last month, uh, we have basically increased our population by 3%. Uh, so uh, having done this within such a short period of time, of course, uh, also um, is, uh, from my point of view, one of the examples of the kind of reality we will be living in. So uh, the practices talked about here uh, in the report, I think they are crucial for our uh, actually survival as a human species on this planet, just as much as the, the changes in our uh, physical uh, behavior towards the resources. Uh, also, of course, uh, the, uh, the mental ones need to be there, otherwise uh, we will just uh, kill ourselves uh, a lot quicker. Uh, so uh, so uh, maybe a few um, uh, concrete examples that I have thought about. I think there is very much this kind of paradigm of, uh, of course, uh, uh, this anthropocentric view that uh, the, the human being is the king in a way, of course. Uh, I understand that we do have uh, uh, maybe uh, capabilities which other species don't have, but uh, it can still be uh, questioned whether uh, we should live on, on uh, uh, the cost of uh, everything else. So I see daily uh, in the thinking of uh, all of us that we are the owners. And I think the, the change of thinking from ownership to uh, maybe caretaking, or something like that is is so crucial. I am sitting on the board of the Estonian National Forest uh, Management uh, Center, which uh, basically should take care of half of uh, Estonia's uh, forest. Which, in its turn, Estonia is uh, half of Estonia is covered in forest. And um, and when we are uh, having the discussions of how this company is proceeding, of course, it is also 10% of our GDP, but it is actually actually owned by all of us, so to say, and, uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, not by any of us, in a way. Uh, we are all just uh, caretakers of it. And, and I see this as a, as a very sort of concrete uh, uh, way of the culture of thinking within the organization, uh, within the businesses that are connected to it. But on the other hand, the uh, sort of question for also environmental uh, democracy comes in. 
uh, more and more people realize that these uh, resources uh, do not belong to a specific group of people. Uh, Caroline was mentioning this uh, sort of every man's right to walk, to pick mushrooms, to, to, to get to the forest. We, we very much have it, with, it's written in the law basically, like in the, in the rest of the Nordic countries. But even so, I wouldn't uh, say this means that uh, we are uh, very long on that path of understanding that, uh, that we are not the owners. So, so this is something uh, that we, we deal with daily. Another example, we have looked a lot, of course, uh, crucial transition, the energy transition. Uh, how uh, we have look, looked at how to also have more renewables in Estonia and, and uh, our, of course, our energy consum consumption as a small country is smaller than what we actually could do in uh, terms of, for example, wind energy. And today I just heard a fellow parliamentarian uh, tell me that, uh, but why should we even bother? I mean, there is no uh, benefit in it for Estonia, other than the tax we get from the use uh, of the land. And, and also there is this uh, kind of some, some kind of understanding that, um, of course, it is not only Estonia who is uh, affected. So I think among politicians, of course, some kind of questions of nationality and some kind of borders uh, also come in. Sometimes I think uh, I am maybe I can't be a politician if I don't uh, uh, think more about uh, the people of my country than the people of some some other place. So so that was maybe one um, uh, one point as well. Uh, on the other hand, of course, I think there is uh, a huge positive. Um, uh, possibility or, or uh, potential here, here as well. I think in, in general, in the, in the recent uh, hundred years, when maybe uh, ownership and uh, things have uh, tried to, uh, or, or, or some kind of uh, physical well-being has uh, started to uh, dominate over uh, 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 some kind of connection to, to something higher or some kind of, um, I, I, I wouldn't like to say spiritual or um, or religious uh, values, but but values in in, in general, or uh, I think human uh, human beings still have a huge need for uh, for this kind of vertical uh, dimension uh, in life. Uh, so uh, so I see, uh, of course, um, I think also within uh, in in my country, I have seen a huge rise in this kind of uh, need for nature or or this need for this reconnection. Uh, during the pandemic, we had, uh, I think, within uh, on this, uh, we have these like nature tracks in this uh, Estonian national forest, and uh, the the visits uh, to there increased, I think, um, three times or something during during these um, years, of course, as well, because many of the the other sports facilities were closed. But but I think it's a general trend, actually. Sometimes. Uh, and, and, and I, I do uh, think there is a connection to um, a technology or it's like the other side of us uh, sitting with technology uh, for, the, for the rest of the day, so to say. I think there is almost some, some kind of fear of uh, disconnection from nature, which can be turned uh, into a positive thing if, if taken into consideration. Uh, the third difficult, uh, most difficult aspect is, of course, how to put all these, uh, all, all this potential into work, how to get these practices and also other practices which turn attention inward, uh, which somehow also, uh, and also, is it about mental health or, or I think it's broader than that, of course, it's not always only about mental health, it's also about uh, uh, being a holistic person and uh, and uh, and also as a holistic person being able to connect to another person or or another uh, environment so uh, so i think there there is a huge way to go i think of course from my point of view a, a huge thank you i think a tour is on uh, on the way uh, by the authors to uh, all the parliaments stakeholders businesses all, all i can do to help you i i am very uh, 
happy to join in. I think this is uh, uh, not a house that will be finished as an architect. I have to conclude with that. This, <laughs> this is a city that will be built forever. So thank you to all the authors and uh, just give a shout if there is anything I can do to get the word out and to try and find solutions. Thank you so much, Yoko. And I'm sure we'll definitely be taking you up on that offer. <laughs> So um, because of timing, I'm going to move straight on um, to our final panellist, Tom Rivet Karnak. And just a reminder that you can send Q&A through for all of the panellists and we'll have a Q&A session for around 30 minutes at the end. Um, so Tom is a former political lobbyist for the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and he's founding partner of Global Optimism, co-presenter of a podcast called Outrage and Optimism and co-author of a book called The Future We Choose, The Stubborn Optimist's Guide to the Climate Crisis, which I absolutely love as a book title. So um, over to you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and wonderful to be here. And can I just say what a huge privilege it is first to join you all, and secondly, to speak after two such incredibly inspiring politicians. I speak after politicians sometimes, and I very rarely have the experience of being so inspired by them before I speak. So thank you, both of you. I'm very pleased that you're doing what you do. And Caroline, I have something to do with Westminster, so I know what you face on a daily basis. So thank you for doing it. Um, <clears throat> this makes me very happy to be here today talking to you about this report. Um, I think it's taken us a while collectively as people who are interested in these issues to realize the fundamental connection between mindfulness and the outcome that we're trying to drive. And the reality that we're actually not gonna manage what we're trying to do in dealing with the climate and biodiversity crisis unless we're able to bring these two things together. I'm gonna read you just a very short quote, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> from Gus Speth, who probably many of you know, he started the World Resource Institute, he was at Yale School of Forestry. And he said towards the end of his career, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought 30 years of good science could address these problems, and I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And that quote for me really goes to the heart of this. And part of why it makes me so happy is I actually spent most of my twenties as a Buddhist monk in monasteries in Southeast Asia. And I came out with that fundamental conviction that this is how we change the world, that we need a transformation of values. And what I understood then as habits of mind, we have developed unhealthy habits of mind that have not, I wouldn't say they're not baked into us, but they have become so well ingrained as habits that they seem to be part of the furniture and what we euphemistically call human nature, but actually they are entirely transformable. And when I left the monastery 20 years ago, I felt that that was what I was gonna go and work on. And I left to go and sort of enter the world, do something on climate. And what I found was a whole bunch of people who were working on this issue way down in the weeds of all of these specific details. And so I plowed in and tried to play my part and have done so over the decades and I can get into some of that, but I never lost that conviction that that's where we need to get to. And it's more true now than ever, right? I mean, we are now in the middle of the most decisive decade in human history. And that sounds like an exaggeration, but we all know that it's not. Whether we have, tropical glaciers or tropical forests or intact ecosystems on the beaches of Norfolk and Devon in 50 years, 500 years or 5,000 years are dependent on what we do in the next five to 10 years. And that's an enormous amount for us to internalize and understand, but we're not really getting there at the moment. And the, the biggest statistic that demonstrates that for me is during COVID, emissions dropped by about eight to 9%. Now that's huge, right? That they dropped by eight to 9%. But my first question when I saw that considering how disrupted all of our lives were was, well, what about the other 91 to 92%? We need to get to zero. And what that demonstrated to me was that the model that we are basing all of this on, this throughput model of digging stuff up as quickly as we can, utilizing it and then throwing it away again is really ultimately unredeemable and that we need to move away from it. That's not to say that there's not important work going on to actually address that issue and we should continue to do this, but in the end, we need to move away from that. And how are we gonna succeed in doing that? It's gonna be by transforming our habits of mind. And Jamie, what I really love about your initial presentation about this report was it was so practical. 
here are some of the specific changes that we need to make that can be implemented from a policy perspective that give us a chance of changing some of these habits of mind. Because that's the other point that I'd like to make, because I had this conversation recently with Yuval Noah Harari on our podcast, and Yuval is very interesting. He credits mindfulness and meditation with the construction of all of his books. He's a very deep and serious Vipassana meditator. And I started off my conversation with him with a comment that I thought he would immediately jump on saying, surely the trick to transformation of the world here is about mindfulness and personal spiritual development. And he cut me down. He said, I've done this for 30 years so I can say something about the efficacy of it, but I can also some, say something about the practicality of it. The truth is that we might think it's hard decarbonizing our energy grids, but it's a lot harder trying to get the whole world to grow up emotionally and look mindfully at their own emotions and the state of how they are. I mean, that's gonna make decarbonizing the electricity grid look like a picnic. So the piece that I would point out here is that it is a tool for transformation, but it has to be step by step, right? We all know what it's like to be left alone with our mind for an hour or a week. And it's no picnic for most of us, right? Because our minds, we're not used to that level of removing sensory engagement. And it can be quite unpleasant for a while and quite challenging. So we need to give people a sense of how do you engage in mindfulness that quickly demonstrates the rewards of quiet and of calm. And again, we've reached the perfect moment for it because the truth is that we are all increasingly aware of just how unhappy capitalism and the speed of the economy that we're in is making us. And there's lots of evidence to show that it's making us unhappy and it's making us lonely. So those are a couple of points about the effectiveness of the change in the world. It's fundamental, but it's hard. And we need to find on-ramps for people that are practical, that make this desirable so that they can incorporate this into their worldview that make the change. But the other piece that I would point out here is just about the importance for us personally. And I would echo much of what Caroline said earlier. You know, this is a hard time to be alive. It's anxiety inducing, we're facing a challenge that appears to be slipping away from us. Um, and we feel a sense of responsibility and disempowerment at the same time for that. Um, we watch our kids, 40% of whom, according to recent statistics that I saw, worry about climate change for multiple hours on a daily basis. That is an experiment in anxiety that we have never really created on a generation before. And it's deeply concerning and, and it's, it's, it pierces you actually when you see what that looks like on a personal basis. We need to find a way of developing the mindfulness and encouraging people to wake up to the moment that we're in and realize that it is dark and it's challenging, but also it's on us, right? And what makes a good life? A good life isn't necessarily an easy life. A good life is where you're able to do things to make life better for other people and for the natural world. And actually, if we can bring awareness of that fact and mindfulness of that fact to our lives right now, there's never been a better time to be alive and demonstrate the impact that we can make because we can really change the future. Those statistics I gave you about 50 years and 500 years, that's on us. We're the ones that are gonna make the difference. And the final thing I'd say is, you know, I've been fortunate to do many things in my life and work with many people, but just one example that I think um, is indicative here is the transformation that happened on the road to the Paris Agreement. And in this, I learned from Christiana Figueres as I worked with her for many years before we created that transformation. What we saw there, that was a process that was regarded as impossible to make a transformation in. People hadn't achieved an outcome in the climate negotiations for decades. What was the difference at that time? Of course, there were many things, but fundamentally, what was understood was that this was first a shift in perspective and mindset and attitude and approach from the people who had to have something to do with this. And the outcome came afterwards. We talk about this as a kind of gritty and determined and stubborn optimism that actually, if you find a way that you can not ignore the reality of what you're facing, but refuse to believe that it is beyond humans to deliver an outcome that is necessary at a critical moment, that creates a positive momentum that draws others into that energy. And if you can combine that with more of a mindfulness of the moment that we're in, et cetera, then you can actually build something that can deliver you further and faster than you otherwise could if you were trying to control it. That is directly the story that we would tell and that we would understand having lived through it of how the Paris Agreement was created. It first started with a mindset shift. The change in the world came after that. 
So just a few thoughts, really keen to have a conversation. Thank you for doing this. I'm sure it's been a lot of work. Um, look forward to seeing how it affects the world and helping in any way I can and to some conversation now. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, I'm gonna open it up and do some questions uh, shortly, but before I do, I know that Jamie has a question that I think he would like to ask you, Tom, after your, your thoughts then. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, so Tom, I really appreciate your stubborn optimism uh, perspective. Um, and uh, we have a chapter in the report that references that, you know, it, it, we talk about the role of positive emotions and engagement. Uh, preceding that, we also have a, 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 a section on uh, psychological resilience, um, which, which sort of treats some of the other emotions that have been mentioned, you know, the more difficult or negative emotions, uh, you know, grief, anxiety, um, uh, d d depression. Um, and I, I recently had a, had a debate with Rupert Reed, who was the uh, one of the sort of former spokesman of Extin Extinction Rebellion. Um, and he's, he's really on the side of thinking that actually we need more difficult emotions. Uh, we need to actually sort of like stimulate difficult emotions so that, so that people can you know, really engage with, um, with that, uh, the, the, the shame, the guilt, the anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, it feels that, 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 that you, know, you, you are somewhat on, on another pole. And I think the evidence points to there being a role for actually, you know, uh, feeling into that difficult emotions and also for positive emotions. I was just wondering whether you could say a little bit more about, about how those, those, uh, those two sides of our emotional landscape um, fit together in your thinking. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and I would not disagree with anything that you said. I think that it is essential to feel those feelings of grief, of the emotionality of the moment that we're in, to go through a sense of anxiety. And I would never say that turning away from the reality of what we're facing is, is ever healthy to try to precipitate action or emotionally healthy. When we talk about stubborn optimism, what we actually say is that you develop a sense of determination and willingness to engage in the issue while also looking full in the face, the full scope of the tragedy that's unfolding and feeling it as deeply as you're capable of. I appreciate that it is kind of deliberately counter-definitional stubborn optimism and it can sound like it's got this kind of shrill darkness to it because the language sounds that it's sort of just about I'll just ignore it and assume that you can be stubborn and everything will be fine don't use that language right I mean the suffragettes use the word courage Joanna Macy uses active hope I think they all mean broadly the same thing and it doesn't really matter if we start arguing about the language then it will become absurd right so we're not attached to that really we just use that because we find it attractive um but i completely agree that we need to feel those really deep senses of um of grief the one that i would maybe part company with you on what you just said is shame i don't think shame is always a useful emotion and i see in the world that there's a lot of shaming that goes on at the moment, a lot of environmental shaming. I see what happens in businesses when those on the outside try to make them feel shame about what they're doing. And actually it precipitates entirely the opposite reaction to the one we think it will. It precipitates a, well, who are they to say this and this there? Nobody wants to feel shame. We will tell ourselves a different story that stops us from feeling that. So I think piercing people with the sense of grief and personal responsibility at this moment, and that's what is so powerful about the school strikers, can be really helpful, can lead you through that to something more constructive that we enjoy calling stubble optimism. But shame, I think, is a bit different. And I'm not sure, because the environmental community is now largely driven by people trying to shame each other. And I'm actually quite worried about that. Mm, really great point. Yeah, and there's, there's evidence to say that that's, uh, yeah, that is unhelpful in many circumstances. Um, okay, thank you for that little uh, takeover. Ruth, back over to you. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, so I'm going to turn to some of the brilliant questions that we've had come through. I'm going to suggest one of you to kind of take the lead on answering, but please feel free to either stick your hand up or jump in if you also have something to say on the question. Um, so I'm going to ask this in, in groups of three as well, just so that we don't um, kind of waste time toing and throwing. So I've got three questions here really about um, mindfulness and politics when we come to this space. So I think you've touched on this a little already, Caroline, and, and Tom, you did as well, but we've had a question about how mindfulness and compassion helps you in your daily work as politicians. 
um, and also whether or not there have been work on changes in regulations or policies that you're aware of where the inner dimension has been talked about or seen as an important pillar uh, pillar in the um, regulations that are being looked at. So that's kind of a, a, a couple of questions there. Um, and the next one is it feels like slowing down, connecting to nature is something that obviously we've all talked about. And we all know it's important. Is there a way or have you had experience of politicians actually connecting with nature on an experiential level? Or really, is it just looking at kind of it from a cognitive perspective and looking at statistics and reports? So if I could turn to Caroline first to talk on those, that would be great. Thanks very much, Ruth, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for the questions. Um, going in reverse order around politicians connecting with nature, I think it's quite interesting that a number of the um, non-government organisations are really kind of getting a bit active in this space. I think they realise there's a limit to the impact that very closely typed briefing sheets can have after a certain, uh, after a certain number of them. Uh, and I would highlight two things in particular just this week. Um, the RSPB, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, um, hosted a bird watching uh, morning or a couple of hours um, in, in one of the parks in London and uh, invited politicians to come along. Sadly, I couldn't make that one, but I did go to the one the year before or a couple of years before. And there was a real um, diversity of, of politicians there, MPs that I'd never particularly seen in meetings on the environment before. So I think that was a, a clever move. And then there's been um, another move by a number of the environment organizations working together, um, which I think was really, really clever, which has, has been to offer different MPs the opportunity to be a species champion for, for different things. So I was given, um, I am the species champion, you'll be pleased to know, for the round-headed rampion, which is the, um, the blue flower that is the uh, sort of emblem of Sussex and someone else is the is the species champion for the swift and someone else is, you know, for the badger or whatever else. But it's just quite a, it's, it's, it's an emotive way in to then get into other discussions. And I think it's, I think it's quite, I don't want to say clever because that makes it sound like it's a little bit too kind of manipulative, but it's, it's an intelligent, it's a wise way of trying to engage politicians' hearts as well as their heads. And I think there's an increasing understanding that that is happening now. Um, and I've now forgotten the first question. I'm so sorry. What was the, what was the first one you asked? No, that's OK. And I'm so glad that you clarified that the blue headed rampion was a flower because I had an image in my head of a blue headed animal, which was quite strange. <laughs> <laughs> so the, um, the other question was around how mindfulness and compassion help you in your daily life as a politician. I think this really comes back to, you know, Christine's presentation about being a lonely pioneer in this yes. world, you know, so. We could talk a bit on that. Uh, and I then mean, maybe Yoko as well, that would be great. I mean, particularly in the Bear Pit, which is Westminster. I've no idea what the Estonian Parliament is like. I would I would love to come and see, but in Westminster, you, you know, it is a, a place which is so polarized, which is designed to have people shouting at each other and and just being, you know, using behavior that one, one would never use in any other place. And it can be incredibly intimidating. And I do find it helpful just to remind myself some of the basics of, of the kind of mindfulness practice that we've learned in Parliament, which is about rooting your, your feet on the ground. It is about, it's about breathing and connecting and, and just remembering and getting back in touch with why you're there and feeling that, you know, however much the other side is about to ridicule you, what you're saying actually has value and, and is in touch with your own values. So, we have a, a weekly session in Parliament um, and, um, and I find that immensely helpful and, and sort of take forward the kinds of, of, of things that we practice there into the, into, the, into the rest of the day in Parliament. And I've really tried hard, even on days that are really busy, you know, the temptation then is not to do your mindfulness on that day, but then there was that famous quote, isn't there, from Gandhi or whatever it was saying, you know, on, on, on normal days, I meditate for, for an hour a day. And then on busy days, I meditate for two. I think that's so great because it's exactly on those days when you know you're going to be tossed and turned and have a real, you know, a real kind of difficulty that, that being rooted in that way is so important. So yeah, I, I, I just find taking that moment, even just a couple of seconds to feel rooted makes a difference to how I feel in, in, in that place. Great, thank you. Yes, Yoko, it'd be lovely to hear from you as well and how it's helped you. 
you know yes maybe maybe, maybe to start off with of course uh, it was it was a great event we had when jamie and um, mm. parliamentarian chris ran from uh, uh, from the uk came over a couple of years ago and then we had a great turnout of people listening in the parliament uh, about mindfulness in politics and in the public sector and uh, with uh, some former reports uh, done by the, the mindfulness initiative and um, and then we also started our uh, all party group for, for mindfulness we had a, an eight week course uh, uh, last uh, beginning of last uh, year and uh, about 10% of the Estonian MPs uh, took part and I am happy to say that half of them are now in uh, government uh, among them our uh, minister for uh, for uh, education and our minister for uh, social security so uh, so I do think it was it was a really good thing. Of course, Estonia is so small, and I am happy to say also we are still very much connected to nature. So I I am a little bit um, I can't really relate to that uh, that we need to be forced to go out and connect with nature. Fortunately, I think we do that actually on a daily basis. Uh, most of us. Uh, which is, of course, for an uh, urbanist like myself, uh, sometimes the downside of it is that our urban culture is not very um, uh, well developed. But that's another issue. But uh, personally, that's uh, also quite a tricky question, I would say, because I would say in the last years of um, also having the rather severe uh, burnout and then for three years really working very uh, consciously on my own personal development and uh, with uh, partly also with mindfulness but also with values-based leadership and uh, once you do lose that kind of um, need to prove yourself and um, uh, run through all the walls and uh, uh, then then it's another question of finding uh, what kind of energy are you working on which actually actually keeps you in such a din that also I do assure you our parliament can be uh, even though it has uh, less members but I think uh, the the fields where these kind of things such as uh, power or some kind of uh, I don't even know what it is about. I think most, uh, very many people also stay there because they don't have the, um, some kind of uh, self-esteem enough to actually believe they can do something else and to realize that I don't want to be one of these guys actually. So, um, so maybe uh, sometimes mindfulness is dangerous, but uh, we'll see. I'm sure something good will come out of it for me as well. <laughs> At least I, I might be happy and that might help the ones around me as well. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Yoko. Okay. okay, I'm going to direct the next question at Tom initially, um, um, but I'd be really interested in hearing all of the panellists on this one, actually. And it's how can we manage to keep the climate emergency top on the political agenda um, when there are always so many other crises and kind of immediate and urgent things that need looking at and need attention? Yeah, it's it's such a good question. And it's the it's the question of the ages, really, in the sense that we have so often struggled and we've thought about climate change as an isolated issue. And so therefore, when cost of living issues come up or when something else comes up, then we tend to have to focus on that. And then when we come by the time we come back to climate, something else urgent has happened. And so round and round we go. I think that <clears throat> tragically, um, well, I think there's two things that have happened, um, one of which is, is, is kind of tragic and one of which is positive. Uh, on the tragic side, um, the impacts have now become so great that it actually has become an urgent issue. And it's intersected with so much else that's happening in our lives, whether it's you know, kids struggling with air, with air issues and polluted air. And there's been lots of examples of that in London, sadly, and all other parts of the world. Um, or actually the impacts of climate change manifesting in our day-to-day -day lives already. I mean, if you haven't then, and I know it's not necessarily the places where those of us who are on the call are living, but just look for a few minutes after this at what's unfolding right now in India in terms of the heat wave. And it really focuses your mind on, this is a billion people experiencing 125 degree heat. And it is absolutely terrifying what's gonna happen there. So that has now become an urgent issue that is prior, that is, challenging us in the same way that so many other urgent issues are. Um, on the positive side, you know, the solutions to the climate crisis are actually now more economically beneficial than the, than the problems. Um, wind and solar are the cheapest forms of new energy in most parts of the world. It is more cost effective, actually, 
to make, to invest in the solutions and take steps towards them rather than continue with the status quo. The challenge is that we're not seeing, with some notable exceptions, the political space that that opens up being grasped by politicians and saying, therefore, we need to accelerate our move off oil and gas. We need to accelerate all these other solutions. The pieces are there, to my mind, as a non-professional politician, that those could be pulled together into a platform that enables further leadership. But in the UK and even in the US, we're not actually seeing that happen. And in the US, Biden is now talking less about climate. Boris doesn't seem to be talking about it much anymore. So we need the political leadership and courage to go along with the changes in the world that are actually integrating this as an urgent issue. Otherwise, it's very difficult for us to capture the potential of this moment to actually make the progress we could make. Caroline or Yoko, do you have anything to add to Tom's? Um, I mean, I, I obviously ag agree with all of that. I think, I think there are some further complications as well. The, the, the first is that, you know, in the even just ten years ago when I was first elected, when um, you know when there was a big statement from the government on something the issue would always be the fact that they hadn't mentioned the environment or they hadn't mentioned climate and that was the point that I would make. Nowadays they sometimes do mention the environment and climate but actually in a way that is misleading and gives the impression that they're actually doing something when they're not and, and that can be an, an, another issue so it's not just about whether it's on the political agenda but whether or not you're actually being told the truth about the way in which it's on the political agenda and the actions that are being taken to address it and in some senses it's almost harder to deal with that than to deal with the fact that they're just not putting it on the agenda at all. So I think, you know, that kind of climate um, delaying and that climate obfuscation is, is, is a challenge in its own right, as well as, as not having it on the political agenda. And then the second thing, which we don't have time to discuss now, but which I think is an interesting question to think about at some point is, I mean, I completely agree with, with, with Tom that one of the best ways to get certain governments at least to to engage is by talking about the economic implications of what of what we're talking about so even if even if people were not um persuaded by the climate arguments if you make the arguments that renewables are far cheaper um then that can reach some people for whom the climate argument isn't isn't so relevant but i think there is an interesting wider debate then to be had about whether there are dangers in that kind of transactional instrumental argument versus the intrinsic argument and i know it's one that the environmental movement has regularly um, and uh, I kind of alternate between the two. On the one hand, you know, if, if you just want to persuade someone to do the right thing, and if the economic argument's going to win it for you, then just use it and stop stop worrying about it. On the other hand, in the longer term, you know, if some of the changes we need to make perhaps are less uh, economically beneficial in the short term and only in the slightly longer term, does that mean we've just argued ourselves into a corner that then means that we're going to have to pivot then to the intrinsic arguments, and and that will be harder because we haven't been making them in the past. So I think those are just things to unpack when we have more time. That's great. Thank you, Caroline. I can see hands up, but I'm afraid I'm going to move on just so that we get to some more of the questions that we've got, because we've got quite a few coming through. And I want to really kind of get back to, you know, the reconnection and the inner dimensions and um, aspects of the climate crisis. So we've got a question here from Jamie, which I'm going to give to Jamie. <laughs> and the question is, I'd like to ask about the relationship between the adoption of recent Western mindfulness practice and the high carbon footprint of those adopters. Sometimes it feels like modern mindfulness can allow us to abdicate responsibility for our own actions because we focus on acceptance or shedding judgment rather than humility. And it can feel like a paradox at the nexus of consumerism and modern mindfulness. And they give the example of quitting your job and flying to Thailand for a yoga retreat. Yeah. So this is, this is absolutely, absolutely key, I think, this, this question. And it, and it um, relates to what Tom said about the gradual shift in, in mindsets that occurs, that we're not gonna, and, and, and also the fact that all, all mindfulness practice isn't equal. And that mindfulness courses aren't just about meditation, they all have components of what is sometimes called psychoeducation, or they all have some kind of implicit framing, like why, why are we all here in this room together to learn mindfulness? What's the, what's the outcome that we want to, to find together is it is it uh, self-regulation benefit which is you know where a lot of people start and to some extent you need to start from where people are 
or are we um or are we coming together in order to be climate leaders you know is there is there, is there, is there a different frame to this kind of uh yeah for, for, for why we're why we're practicing that's absolutely crucial so i have you know i have a mindfulness on my apple apple watch and that, that apparently involves like one minute of breathing which is not the mindfulness that i recognize and it's very different from what is you know tested in in, in maybe up to about seventeen thousand articles now academic articles um which normally involves an like eight week mindfulness course daily practice silent retreat days you know regular practice over a long period of time so absolutely right, like just you know, um, because there are millions and millions of people doing headspace and flying to Thailand, um, uh, uh, um, as you say, um, is not is not the kind of um, the evidence that I'm pointing to. Um, uh, we, we we make the case in the document that mindfulness training and compassion training, which is also um, often tested in a kind of eight week format, a kind of intensive program group program uh is probably a, a net pro-social um uh, good for society there's ample reason to, to believe that but that's not to say that it that it shouldn't evolve to become more socially and ecologically minded and for that that psychoeducation component that i mentioned to be more geared to the change that we need to see collectively so this was really the vision of the of the um, of the innovators who brought mindfulness to us over the last 30, 40 years, like like Professor John Kabat-Zinn. It was always for him a social and collective thing, as well as a. You know, he talked about planetary flourishing and planetary health um, 20, 30 years ago. But one of the issues is we have to put put all that evidence building through our existing uh, methods of of um, science scientific method. It's much easier to test individual benefits. Um, individual outcomes are easier to get funding for because they have kind of health implications, et cetera, et cetera. And so in, in some ways we might have like lost a little bit that original social, social vision. Um, and until, until recently and over, and over the last few years, a number of um, innovators have, uh, have started de developing new programs that have been called social mindfulness, or you could say ecological mindfulness. In fact, Christine, is is is, uh, is is involved in at least two I'm aware of two or three um, programs projects innovating so to creating new mindfulness programs and testing them and that there's been one that we, we we include as a case study in in our report um, provided in the European Commission so there've now been the European Commission and Parliament uh, and Council have paid for a climate leaders program which is which includes mindfulness and compassion based practices that's all geared towards feeling more connected to nature, really turning towards difficult emotions, and then ultimately gearing, gearing us towards action. Um, so, so yeah, three, three bits of that answer, really, like all mindfulness is not, is not, is, is not equal, um, that there are many reasons that we, that, that we point to that says that over time, people's intentions and uh, probably, probably shift, and this is a very gradual thing. So you wouldn't see everyone making huge changes initially, but that we can speed that up and make it more transformative by, by, by innovating. Um, and that's what we urgently need funding and, uh, and policy focus on to make that sort of scale scalable in the time that we have. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everybody, so much for all of your questions. I'm afraid we're not going to get time to go through them all, and I'm going to be cheeky and... Um, jump in with a final question just to ask each of our panelists to give 20 seconds or so on, um, on what do we do with this report how do we get it out there I'm conscious of the fact that everybody on this webinar is probably behind the fact that the inner dimension is so important when it comes to tackling the climate crisis and also in how we respond to it so what should people be doing to try and get the message out there I'm going to go to Caroline Yoko then Tom Christine Jamie to Caroline first, please. Thank you. I was so hoping you weren't going to do that because... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I genuinely am not quite sure. You know, one can think of the ordinary things that one does with a report. One sends it to, to, to all MPs and so forth. But, you know, I don't think that's going to cut it. it. What we need to do with it is something that is more 
in tune with it and intrinsic to the kind of wisdom that it has. And, and that isn't just having it land in an inbox. So I suppose for the minute until I think of a better answer, maybe I'll cheat and, and just echo something that someone else says in a moment. But, um, you know, just talking about it, I think, just talking about it, you know, pick five people that you don't think know much about this issue or have never thought much about this issue and, and have a chat with them over a coffee and talk to them about it. It's a bit of a weak answer, but I'll think of a better one while everyone else goes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. No, I think if uh, all of us here who uh, haven't yet read it uh, properly, like uh, I myself, I only took time to skim it so far. So uh, to actually read it properly and to uh, share it with someone and really talk about it and pick, pick, uh, pick a friend. And of course, I have the possibility to also share it with my uh, parliament colleagues, but uh, we all have colleagues in different institutions and uh, that's how it needs to be done, but starting with yourself, of course. Thank you. Tom. Um, so it's always very difficult to know how to really get the most out of it as should be gotten out of it. But the idea is, you know, there's so many reports coming out now saying we want this, we want that, we want the other, etc. I think that rather than this being another one in that stable, all of those reports should see mindfulness as a way of achieving what they want. So how do you engage with the community of those who are pushing for certain outcomes in this sphere, climate, I mean, democracy, other things beyond that as well, and to help them understand that pushing for policy measures, educational measures that accelerate mindfulness can help them achieve those objectives and your report can help them understand that. I think that could really accelerate what we're trying to do. Great, thank you. Christine. Yes, thank you. Um, difficult question, but I, I think I would start by saying that what Carolyn said is actually not a weak answer because what we are doing here together is we are creating a new story of sustainability. And that means talking to people in all ways we can because we are changing the story of what sustainability is about. Um, it's a creating a new narratives um, in sustainability. So that also leads over to then what Tom said. I think we need to come together as communities and support each other because it's actually not easy both for politicians, policymakers, and for people in the academia to actually change the discourses and actually change from within the structures that we are living in and they are representation of the unsustainable um, discourses and narratives that we have created. So we actually all need, independent of your politicians or decision makers and private companies or academics, we need a network of people where we can somehow support each other. And then together, if we manage to change the discourse from this, um, Climate change is a technical fix, external thing, which then means what you said before, it disappears from the agenda quite quickly because this is how we see it. But if we start to understand it's actually linked to the mind uh, and see that that's the same cause of other crises that we're living, it cannot get off the agenda because then we see how they're all interconnected. Thank you, Christine. Jamie, any final thoughts? Yes. So. In a, in a way, I think it's very similar to what what, what Tom said, but um, perhaps a slightly narrow in as, in as much as there are lots of organisations who talk about the inner dimension of policy, whether they're the Forgiveness Project or Action for Happiness or What Works Centre for Wellbeing. These are kind of UK, um, you know, civil society organisations. Um, and I think we all need to get together and talk about the inner dimension inner dimensions in general, inner capacities. Um, because I find a lot of the time, a lot of, over the last eight years of working in mindfulness and public policy, we're kind of, um, we're tr mindfulness and compassion is trying to do a job on behalf of all of these potential things that we could cultivate about our hearts and minds. And there's a kind of missing step in the public narrative or the policy discourse. Um, and, uh, and, on, and on that note, there's a really promising initiative coming from, from Sweden that Christine and I involved with that's going global in fact um, working with countries like Rwanda and um, Costa Rica is called the Inner Development Goals and there's an Inner Development Goals Summit tomorrow um, that we'll be presenting at again um, and it's got some, just the leading thinkers about all the different dimensions of inner, de uh, de inner development and mindfulness and compassion obviously a big part of that 
and and so and so yeah mindfulness shouldn't be on its own basically um it should be just one part of a bigger conversation about that, that, that you know the whole part of the human that's missing thank you jamie i think that's a lovely note to end on mindfulness is not just on its own and we're not just on our own either and the connection starts here and now so thank you everybody so much for coming and attending and all your great questions and thank you to our absolutely fantastic panelists for giving us their time um, this is just the start of disseminating this report and really getting out there and spreading the message so thank you thank you so much tom yoko and caroline really thank appreciate you. your time